being eaten alive and I'm not being stung to death. But there are one and a half kilos of honeybees in my hands, and that's between 10,000 and 12,000 bees, and not one of those bees has stung me. I keep bees in my garden at home, and this is a film about those bees and their strange and mysterious behaviour. bees have clustered in my hands is because here I have the queen bee in the tin. And all the bees in the swarm are taken to the air and are flying back onto my hands to stay with the queen. I don't advise everybody to do this, because don't forget, 10,000 bees are armed with 10,000 stings. And look at this. I was expecting all these bees to fly back onto my hands. But it looks like they've decided to walk. And the quickest way is up my legs. Now I'm going to try and encourage these bees to stay in the hive by placing the queen bee in there. They're still not stinging, there's no aggression at all. They just want to find a new colony somewhere. So if I put the queen in there, they'll be quite content to stay in the hive. These ones out here on the grass will follow in. And look at this. Here's a good example of the cooperation that exists between honeybees. Because this worker bee, standing at the entrance to the hive, has exposed her scent gland, which is normally concealed between the last two segments of her abdomen. And as she fans her wings, a stream of air passes over the gland and carries her scent out to all the other bees in the swarm. This scent will now help to guide the rest of the swarm into this hive. A swarm of bees, like this one, is nature's way of reproducing a whole colony of bees, not just the individual. The parent queen flies off with the swarm and starts a new colony, while her daughter becomes the queen of the old colony. In this way, nature has just guaranteed the survival of another one of her species. The small yellow and black striped honeybee that we see so often in our gardens is not native to Australia, but was brought here by the first settlers as a domestic source of honey.
only species of honeybee that is native to Australia and lives in large colonies where it stores its honey is this small black bush bee, sometimes called the sweat bee. It looks more like a wasp than a bee, but here you can clearly see the two loads of pollen that it's carrying back to its hive. This particular bee is one of the many species of solitary bees, but they do not live in large colonies, nor do they store their honey in a hive. And these solitary bees, they also spend their days alone, but always congregate at the same roosting place every night. They're hanging onto these dead vines with their powerful jaws, so they can madly wave their legs at the other bees as they claim their territory for the night. Most of the honeybees in Australia today have been imported from their native habitats in either northern Italy or the mountainous areas between Europe and Asia. These honeybees are social insects and live in large colonies of tens of thousands of bees. And yet, the survival of every bee in each colony depends on this long, thin, golden lady, the queen bee. And listen to this strange sound she makes. This is the only queen bee in the hive, and she's the queen and mother of every other bee in the colony and she controls each and every one of them in a most remarkable way. The queen is secreting from her mouth parts certain chemical substances called queen pheromones. These worker bees are now licking these pheromones off her body so they can pass them to all the other bees in the colony. Pheromone chemicals are transferred as the bees share the nectar and honey within the beehive. Under normal conditions, the bees in the colony can never replace their queen because one of the queen's pheromone chemicals actually prevents the physical development of ovaries in all young female bees. This means, of course, that no other bee can become the mother or the queen of the colony. Unless something goes wrong. And something has gone wrong. A population explosion. By mid-spring, the population in this hive has grown to well over 50,000 bees. And that's a lot of bees for the queen to manage on her own. The hive is so crowded that the queen is cramped for space and cannot move around the honeycombs to lay her eggs. These worker bees are unable to get near the queen for her vital pheromone chemicals. The queen's pheromone messages are not being passed to all the other bees in the colony. This means the queen has lost her control over all the other bees in the beehive. In our human society, when our homes become too small or too crowded, it's the children who move out to start a new life. But it's very different in the bee society. In the beehive, it's mother who has to move out. But when she leaves, she takes with her about half her children. This is the swarming instinct of the honeybee. The old queen and about half the bees from the hive have now settled in this tree, clinging desperately to the branch and each other just to stay together as a swarm. Watch carefully, because the weight of bees almost snaps the branch. Of course, 
the swarm of honeybees doesn't always settle where it's convenient to people. bees is one way a beekeeper can start a new hive. All he has to do is catch them. one of the easiest swarms that I've ever collected. Let's have a close look at these little beasts. They seem to be a nice, quiet, friendly strain of bee. Look at this. Now, the only reason I'm risking this is to show you that bees are usually quite docile when they're swarming. So if you ever find a swarm of bees, please don't panic and please don't kill them. Just contact your nearest Department of Agriculture or your local beekeeper and they'll come and take them away. And look at this. Here's a 10,000 to 1 chance because it's the queen bee out of the swarm. I'll let her go in a minute. But first I'll have to cage her in a tin so she can't fly off. Otherwise all these bees will fly out of the bucket just looking for their queen. Okay, the reason I do this in the car is so that if the queen should escape, she'll fly towards the windows and I can just pick her up again. Okay, now let's see if I can pick her out of the netting and transfer her across to the tin. Okay, okay, in you get, in you get. That's it, that's it. Yes, yeah, good. Now I'll be able to put the queen into another hive and attract the swarm of bees that are in the bucket into that hive. Start another one. And she looks a good queen too. Mm -hmm. Before the old queen flew out of this hive with her swarm, the bees in the hive had to make sure they had a new queen to rule their colony. Let's see how they do this. Without the ovary-inhibiting pheromones of the old queen bee, the worker bees construct 10 or 12 wax cups called queen cells. In each cell, a worker bee places a fertilised egg that was laid by the old queen before she left with her swarm. A fertilised egg, like this one, normally develops into a female bee or worker bee. But if these nurse bees feed the larva a very special food, the larva will develop into a new queen bee. This special food is called royal jelly and is secreted like saliva by the young nurse bees. <laughs> 
Royal jelly is so rich in vitamins, minerals and proteins that these queen larvae will evolve into the only bees in the colony capable of laying fertilised eggs. When the larva has fully grown, the worker bees seal up the queen cell so the larva can pupate into the fully developed queen bee. In seven days time, a new queen will rule this bee colony. Seven days have now passed and listen to this strange and mysterious sound. It's the sound of the new queen as she emerges into the bee colony. But look, here is another queen all ready to emerge from her cell. And nature dictates that only one queen can rule the bee colony at a time. The first queen to emerge will have to kill every other queen. Even a queen that has not fully developed is stung to death through the walls of her queen cell. The worker bees then tearing open the cell and dragging out the body. But look, the other queen has already emerged into the colony from her cell. Now the two rival queens will have to fight it out to the death. take long before all the other bees join in the struggle. The fight is all over and the worker bees drag the body of the dead queen out of the hive. Her feet and her wings torn off during the battle. In nature there is no sentimentality. Only the fittest is allowed to survive. Back inside the beehive, drone bees are ready to emerge from these large domed cells. Drones are the only male bees in a bee colony and they have a very special mystery all to themselves. By a phenomenon known as parthenogenesis, the drone bee develops from an unfertilised egg. Although drones are much larger than their sisters, the worker bees, the only service they perform for the bee colony is to mate with the new virgin queen. The drones always mate with the virgin queen outside the hive and at least 20 metres above the ground. Their enormous eyes and powerful wings help them to locate the flying queen. The virgin queen flies out of the hive and spirals higher and higher and higher so only the strongest of the drones can fly high enough to mate with her. Only six or seven drones will successfully mate with the queen and they make the ultimate sacrifice and fall back to earth dead. By now, the queen has returned from her mating flight and began her main function within the beehive, and that is laying eggs. <laughs> 
So let's open up the hive now and take a look inside. Firstly, the smoker. Probably the most important piece of equipment for the beekeeper. The few puffs just inside the entrance. Oh, listen to that. And underneath the lid. Sends the bees rushing around the combs looking for open cells of honey. They plunge their long tongues into that honey and drink it up until they're quite full. This makes the bees extremely docile and very easy for the beekeeper to manage. Now, no one really knows why the smoke has this effect on the bees, nor do we know why taking up that honey subdues the bees and makes them quite handleable, very easy to manage. Look, they've gone inside, they're not aggressive at all. One theory is that bees react to food just like we do, because after a good, solid meal, we tend to slow down a little and relax, and it's the same with the bees after they gorge themselves with honey. Another theory is that it's more anatomical than gastronomical because the bee's honey stomach is just in front of his abdomen which is the last section of the three-piece bee, head, thorax and abdomen. And when that honey stomach is full, the bee cannot get her tail end down into the stinging position. Now just in case the bees do get angry and want to sting, I wear this protective veil. Now I know the temperament of the bees in this hive and they're quiet and very good natured so I don't bother about trousers or gloves. It's a very nice feeling of security to have this piece of gauze between them and bees. Now the top box of this two-story hive is called the super where the bees store any surplus honey they collect during the summer for the cold months of winter. Because you must remember that when there's no flowers, there's no nectar. And if there's no nectar, there's no honey. And if there's no honey, there's no food for these bees. And these bees will require at least 100 kilos of honey just to get them through this year for their own survival. And that's before you and I get one teaspoonful for our toast in the morning. This wire grid between the two boxes is called the queen excluder. And these spaces are just large enough for a worker bee to pass through, even if it's laden with nectar. But they're just too narrow for the queen to get through. Now this keeps the queen down below in the brood chamber and make sure there are no eggs or larvae in the super. The super just contains pure honey. In the wild, honeybees build their honeycombs in caves or trees, like this one hanging underneath this branch. You can see that the bees have built four separate honeycombs side by side for their colony. And what a beautiful piece of engineering it is. To encourage honeybees to live in a box instead of a tree, the beekeeper uses these wooden frames in each hive, maintaining the exact space between each frame as the bees would allow between each honeycomb. The bees are quite happy with their new home because the beekeeper also wires a thin sheet of rolled beeswax into each frame as a foundation or base 
This encourages the bees to build their natural honeycombs to the exact size of each frame. Now these frames allow the beekeeper to inspect his honeycombs one by one, inspecting them for the, the quantity of honey and pollen and also the number of eggs that the queen is laying. Now there are a few eggs on that side, but I can't see the queen, so she's probably on the next frame. Out. Yes, now where are you? Oh, there she is, right in the centre of the cone. And look, she's just about to lay an egg. When the queen finds an empty cell in the honeycomb, she lowers her abdomen into it, and as the egg is deposited, it is actually fertilised by the queen herself. The queen can do this because during her mating flight, the drones implanted her with sufficient sperm to last over five years and to fertilise almost one million new eggs. The most amazing mystery of all is that if the queen does not fertilise the egg, it will develop into a male bee or drone bee. But if she does fertilise the egg, it will develop into a female bee or what we call a worker bee. During spring and summer, the queen will lay nearly 1,500 eggs every day, which is more than the weight of her own body. Three weeks later, the fertilised eggs have developed into these female worker bees, emerging into the bee colony. It's a bit like crawling out of a manhole in the middle of a very busy highway. This young female bee struggling to get free from her cell is very well named a worker bee. She is not even 60 seconds old and yet she instinctively begins to work. Her first duty is to clean out the used cells of the honeycomb to make them ready for the queen to lay more eggs. When she is three or four days old, a special gland in her head has fully developed so she can move on to her next duty as a nurse bee. With her tail up and her head down in the bottom of the cell, she begins feeding the larva after they hatch from the queen's eggs. This larval food is called bee milk and is secreted like saliva from the mouths of the young nurse bees. As the larvae develop, the worker bees add pollen to their bee milk. Pollen is so rich in protein that these larvae will increase in weight over 1,300 times in just six days. In human terms, that would be like your three kilogram baby girl developing into a 4,000 kilogram teenage daughter. The worker bees then seal up the cell with beeswax so the larva can pupate into the fully developed adult worker bee. <laughs> 
along with thousands and thousands of her future sisters. After about 10 days as a nurse bee, the worker bee begins her next duty for the bee colony. This time she's taking the pollen and nectar from the older field bees when they return to the beehive from our fields and gardens. This passing of nectar between honeybees is the vital link in their communications network. As the worker bee takes the nectar, the two bees tap and caress each other's feelers to pass on the colony's messages. I wonder what they're saying. After this exchange of nectar, the field bee cleans her tongue, ready to fly off for another load of this precious food. And the worker bee deposits the nectar into one of the honey cells. Nectar contains up to 80% water, which will have to be evaporated before the nectar can mature into honey. The mature honey is then capped over with beeswax to preserve the honey until it is required by the rest of the colony. This full frame of freshly capped honeycomb contains almost three kilograms of pure honey. If we were to consume large quantities of sugars, we would put on weight in the form of fatty tissue. The honeybee has a far more mysterious and amazing reaction to consuming so much nectar and honey. She produces wax. These small opaque scales between the segments of her abdomen are scales of beeswax. The worker bees scrape these scales off their bodies and then mould them in their jaws to form the hexagonal cells of the honeycomb. These cells are so perfectly constructed that a mere 100 grams of beeswax can support over 3,000 grams of honey. Air conditioning the beehive is the next duty of the young worker bees. By standing at the entrance to the hive and fanning their wings, the bees draw stale, humid air out of the hive. While on this side, just inside the entrance, there are bees fanning fresh air into the hive. Inside the hive, these bees are circulating air to maintain a constant temperature of 34 degrees centigrade, summer and winter. This circulating air also helps to evaporate the moisture from the cells of nectar so it can ripen into honey. When the worker bee is about three weeks old, she begins her last duty in and around the hive as a guard bee, protecting the hive from trespassers and robbers. And look what happens to this beetle that has strayed into the hive entrance by mistake. Most of us know just how painful a bee sting is, but have you ever wondered how it works? Watch closely. <laughs> 
And look what happens to the poor bee. Well, normally I'd just flick this sting straight out. But I'll show you what an amazing weapon this sting really is. Unfortunately, that bee will now die from internal injuries after losing its sting. But the sting itself lives on. The bee's sting has a barbed spear on either side of it so that when one barb is caught under the skin, the other barb can penetrate even further. This pulls the sting deeper and deeper into the victim, like this. But what is even more amazing is that the poison sac on top of the sting continues pumping poison into the victim long after the sting has torn away from the bee. Now I'll show you the correct way to remove a bee sting. The main thing is to get it out quickly. Just use a sharp edge or your fingernail and just scrape it out like that. There, didn't hurt a bit. When a worker bee is about three weeks old, she finishes her duties in and around the hive. But a worker bee lives only six very short weeks in summer, so half her life is over. Now that she's old enough, it's her turn to fly off and gather the pollen and nectar for future generations of bees in this colony. These beautiful play flights by the new field bees help them to orientate their particular hive to its surroundings so they can find it when they return from our fields and gardens. Pollen is the most important part of the diet of young bee larvae and the honeybee is perfectly equipped for gathering this precious food. This little worker bee is using her legs, her jaws and the hairs on her body to collect the small grains of pollen from this flower. She moistens the dry pollen with a little honey from her mouth. And if you watch carefully, you'll see her use her middle legs to brush the pollen off her body. There. She then manipulates the sticky pollen into the pollen baskets on her back legs. A worker bee gathering pollen will only visit flowers of the same species on each trip. This is nature's way of guaranteeing the successful cross-pollination of all the flowers within that particular species. On this trip, she is visiting pumpkin flowers. And look, her whole body is covered with pollen from the male flowers. Most of the honey in Australia comes from the blossoms of our most prolific forest trees, the eucalypts. Each particular species giving the nectar its own very distinctive flavour. Although sometimes there's a lot of competition for this sweet nectar. The nectar appears in small droplets on the base of the flowers and the worker bee laps it up with her long tongue and stores it in her abdomen in a small sac called the honey stomach. This sac is not much bigger than a pinhead, yet she may have to visit over 500 flowers just to fill it up once. When it is full, she flies back to her hive where she performs a most mysterious an amazing dance. <laughs> 
The dance of the honeybee is a means of communicating to the other field bees the exact distance, direction and species of flowers that are producing pollen or nectar. This worker bee is dancing at 90 degrees to the right of the vertical plane of the honeycombs. This means there are flowers at 90 degrees to the right of the present direction of the sun. Now she is passing around samples of the nectar, so the field bees know the taste and scent of the flowers to be visited. Experiments have shown that the dancing bee is also communicating the exact distance of the flowers. By the speed she dances this figure eight pattern. I timed this bee and she is dancing one full turn every second which means the flowers are 900 metres from the hive. From this extraordinary dance, the other bees know there are flowers 900 metres from the hive and at 90 degrees to the right of the present position of the sun. So they fly out of the hive and directly to this plentiful supply of nectar. A worker bee can fill up with over half her own body weight of nectar. No wonder she's such a wobbly fly when she flies back to the hive. But some of the field bees never make it back to their beehive. Although it's not just spiders that account for all the deaths in the bee colony, it's a far more mysterious instinct that drives most of the honeybees to their deaths. When the wings of the worker bee have frayed so much that she can no longer carry her share of the pollen and nectar for the good of the bee colony, she turns her back on her hive and walks away to die. Sometimes quite cruelly. Just look at the incredible strength of these tiny ants as they carry off this dying bee. The deaths of these older bees barely affect the colony at all, because already a new generation of worker bees is on the wing, ready to replace them. There are still many mysteries in the beehive that remain unsolved, even with all our modern science and technology. But there is one side of beekeeping that is no mystery. This, pure golden honey in pure golden honeycomb. To extract the honey from a sealed honeycomb, I have to remove the wax cappings that the worker bees placed over the matured honey. To do this, I use a hot steam knife that can easily slice through this soft wax. Mm, this looks like a beautiful honey. Mm. After the wax cappings have been removed from both sides of the frame, yeah, the frames are spun two at a time in this centrifuge, or honey extractor. The extractor throws the honey out of the wax cells and leaves the honeycombs undamaged, so I can put the frames back into the beehive. 
doesn't that look delicious? Let's try some. Honey is a natural food that honeybees produce by concentrating and ripening nectar. A worker bee may have to visit over 500 flowers for a single load of this precious nectar, and yet 80% of that load is water, which will have to be evaporated. In fact, it would take almost 1,000 bees to gather enough nectar to ripen into just one teaspoon of honey for our breakfast. No wonder man has always admired this remarkable insect, the mysterious honeybee. being eaten alive and I'm not being stung to death. But there are one and a half kilos of honeybees in my hands and that's between 10,000 and 12,000 bees and not one of those bees has stung me. I keep bees in my garden at home and this is a film about those bees and their strange and mysterious behaviour. The small yellow and black striped honeybee that we see so often in our gardens is not native to Australia, but was brought here by the first settlers as a domestic source of honey. The only species of honeybee that is native to Australia and lives in large colonies where it stores its honey is this small black bush bee, sometimes called the sweat bee. It looks more like a wasp than a bee, but here you can clearly see the two loads of pollen that it's carrying back to its hive. This particular bee is one of the many species of solitary bees, but they do not live in large colonies, nor do they store their honey in a hive. And these solitary bees, they also spend their days alone but always congregate at the same roosting place every night. The reason all these bees have clustered in my hands is because here... I have the queen bee in the tin. And all the bees in the swarm taken to the air and flying back onto my hands to stay with the queen. 
don't advise everybody to do this, because don't forget, 10,000 bees are armed with 10,000 stings. And look at this. I was expecting all these bees to fly back onto my hands. But it looks like they've decided to walk. And the quickest way is up my legs. Now I'm going to try and encourage these bees to stay in the hive by placing the queen bee in there. They're still not stinging, there's no aggression at all. They just want to find a new colony somewhere. So if I put the queen in there, they'll be quite content to stay in the hive. These ones out here on the grass will follow in. And look at this. Here's a good example of the cooperation that exists between honeybees. Because this worker bee, standing at the entrance to the hive, has exposed her scent gland, which is normally concealed between the last two segments of her abdomen. And as she fans her wings, a stream of air passes over the gland and carries her scent out to all the other bees in the swarm. This scent will now help to guide the rest of the swarm into this hive. A swarm of bees, like this one, is nature's way of reproducing a whole colony of bees, not just the individual. The parent queen flies off with the swarm and starts a new colony, while her daughter becomes the queen of the old colony. In this way, nature has just guaranteed the survival of another one of her species.